Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. The Democrats won the White House, but are they going to be torn apart between their progressives and their centrists? Let's get to the bottom line. When the American people spoke on Election Day, they sent a mixed message. In many places, they voted against Donald Trump, but then they voted for other Republican politicians in their district and in their state. The Democrats went into this election thinking they were going to pick up an easy 15 more seats in the House of Representatives, but they wound up losing seven seats to the Republican Party. They're going to keep their majority, but this is going to lead to many more votes that are what I call squeakers or just getting by. On last week's show, we focused on some of the lessons that Republicans might be learning from this election. And this week, we're going to talk to a leading Democratic senator to see what kind of soul searching his party is doing these days. He is Senator Joe Manchin, who represents the state of West Virginia, where he previously served as governor. And he's the only Democrat still standing, elected to a federal position from his state. So let me just put it to you. Which agenda won? Did the agenda of wiping out student loans, of health care for everyone, uh, did, did that progressive agenda win? Or did a more cautious, deal-making, centrist agenda, agenda win this election? I'm not sure anybody won from that standpoint because there was nothing overwhelmingly supported by either side. We were split right down the middle and we're still split down the middle, Steve. I can only speak of West Virginia and tell you how West Virginians feel. Basically on all the opportunities that, that they're given, they're very appreciative. Anytime the government is involved, uh, that gives them an opportunity, whether it be health care, employment, jobs, uh, those are always very welcome. But when the scare tactics or you scare the bejesus out of them by making uh, them believe that there's going to be some type of an energy shift that'll take jobs away and not even give them recognition for what they've done and opportunity to continue to live in West Virginia, that scares them. And then they get mad if they do lose, like anyone else, if you lose your opportunity to provide uh, for your family and yourself, that's very scary. So with all of that, it's, it's a tremendous uh, challenge that we have right now I still am of the belief there's more that divide, uh, there are more that unites us than divides us as a country. We're still the United States. Uh, we might be a little fragmented right now, but we always come back and, uh, and I think we'll come together. But uh, I heard you uh, and you were talking just briefly there about where we stand uh, as, a, as a country and uh, basically the different direction we're going to go because the House didn't win seats, it lost seats. Still has a majority, but a slimmer majority. The Senate didn't get the majority which it thought it would get, and we're not sure if we will get it or not because we're still waiting on the results of two elections in Georgia in January. But no matter what happens, we are much closer in numbers that make it harder for any one side to have the fringes from controlling them, which the hard left or the hard right has very little control over a very narrow margin in either House or the Senate. So I think it gives us a tremendous opportunity and come to the realization that we have to work together, Steve, versus just fighting for our respective sides because there's no comfort there. There's nobody, if, if the Senate becomes 52 to 48 or becomes 50-50, if the House has to rely on not losing some of their moderate Democrats to stay in control, then that'll bring them back to the middle. And the moderate middle is where we run our lives, where we run our, our businesses, and where we run our country from. And we've got to get back to that. So maybe it's a blessing in disguise. I'm not sure yet. Well, let me ask you, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, Senator, that you uh, were now, for in, in terms of those that are elected to federal office, the last Democrat in West Virginia, you also happen to be overwhelmingly popular in West Virginia. Uh, in, a, in a state that's conservative, you stand out. And I'm just interested in whether we can derive any lessons from that as now President-elect Biden uh, thinks about reaching out to those 71 million people who voted for President Trump. Well, as I saw the last figure, there's 73 million and 78 million voted for Donald Trump, I mean, voted for Joe Biden. So it's a tremendous, overwhelming victory, but there's an awful lot of people that maybe aren't in sync. How many of those will start looking at reality? Uh, 
I've said this before. The bottom line, we need to, we need to cure our, our country of this pandemic. We need to rid it with a vaccine and antibodies that work. And until that happens, it'll be hard for us to get back to the normals that we had before. I don't think the new normal will be what the old normal was. And with that, there might be greater opportunities that we have. We have to be prepared and ready to do that. And I think the, the, the more, uh, the more uh, reliance we have on science and not denying it and give people false hopes that it's not going to harm them and it's just basically a hoax, it's nothing real, don't worry about, about it. I think we've seen, Steve, that this is serious. This is a killer, not just in the United States of America, all over, our, all over the world. And we need to be attacking much more serious than what we have been. So hopefully we'll come together on that. And next of all, we need a bipartisan bill. What's the best bipartisan bill you can start with that everybody agrees needs to be done? I've said this, if you have a bad road, a pothole, if you have a bridge that's falling down, uh, trust me, uh, that pothole and bridge and bad road doesn't know if you're a Democrat or Republican, it'll bust your tire, tear your car up and make endanger your life. That's something Democrats and Republicans can agree on. Let's do something that unites us. Let's do a major bipartisan bill as far as infrastructure, connecting all rural America. The divide between rural and urban is getting deeper and deeper. The chasm is growing. And with that, we've got to come together. How do you do it? You do it with infrastructure. You do it with broadband connectivity, rural connectivity, the same as FDR brought our country together during the greatest depression the world has ever known. That's what we need to do. So that's what we're working on. And we're going to try to hopefully, uh, with the Biden administration, work in a most pragmatic way to start repairing and uniting, not only opportunity-wise, job-wise, but truly uh, the emotional generational gap that we have and, and, uh, and making sure that we understand each other a little better. Thank you for that. Part of the trauma of this year has not just been COVID, but it's been the murder of George Floyd. It's been the you know uh, protests over racial divides and economic uh, justice issues in the country. Do you think there is a program out there that can address some of this, you know, racial justice and economic justice uh, uh, these issues without losing the center and play to that area? Well, I think we all, we've all heard basically the, the defund the police. That is the most ludicrous, ludicrous thing I've ever heard, Steve. Why would you defund when you know you have a problem? You would invest more, but expect better results. That would be, why wouldn't we be, uh, we do less training than most civilized nations with our police forcing. And the continuing education that should, should be coming uh, demanded by every police force to know the social challenges and social changes that are happening in their in the areas they, they police because it's it's most of these areas are transforming themselves with all the new uh, influx of population growth and shifts that's going on and i think they should be basically uh, experienced in that and, and educated towards the, the needs that they have there but uh, so when they use the that they scared the bejesus out of a lot of people that we're going to defund the police and we're going to accept the looting and rioting. There's not a Democrat that I know of that's in favor of defunding. If anything, we're in favor of more funding and better targeted funding of how we expect the police to be trained. And next of all, in the areas that have, had, have been hit the hardest, we've got to get in there and basically start building a social gathering, if you will, uh, and I'll never forget after 9-11 in little West Virginia, you know, we're probably the least diverse state in the nation. But when I was governor, we start bringing all the denominations and churches and religious so we could understand Islam and we can understand from our from our brothers and sisters, whether it be our rabbis, our priests, our preachers. Uh, we wanted to know what was going on. We had them all together from the rabbi to the imam to to uh, the priest to to the. A pastor, we had them all trying to explain to us the social challenges that we have and how we would better embrace that so we'd understand it better. That needs to be done more now than ever. You know, you, you talk about defunding the police, and I just want to read a, a tweet that you sent out and that um, Representative Alexandria <laughs> Ocasio-Cortez yeah, uh, then retweeted that. with her giving you the devil's stare 
uh, when you were looking at this, and it says, defund the police, defund my butt. I'm a proud West Virginia Democrat. We're the party of working men and women. We want to protect Americans' jobs and health care. We do not have some crazy socialist agenda, and we do not believe in defunding the police. She sent that out with her just staring at you, <laughs> no words. So I guess that gets at the point of part of the question of the divide, right? Is to get at this question of what's happening with the soul of the Democratic Party, where that struggle is, and what role you're going to play in that. I mean, I remember, uh, I mean, you're kind of, you know, in an interesting vice. I want to remind uh, uh, our viewers that when you ran two years ago, Donald Trump Jr. was going and campaigning against you in that state, and you still won with the Trump machine going after you. But now you got you had Don Trump Jr. on one side, and now you've got Alexandria Ocasio Cortez on the other. How does that feel? Well, first of all, that was the president himself came in six times. The president mm -hmm. Donald Trump came to my state six times campaigning against me. And afterwards, I told him, I said, I wasn't running against my opponent. I was running against you, Mr. President, because that's what basically you put. And the people in West Virginia says, we want our senator, not your senator, Mr. President. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been tough. It really has been. And now to have that, when you said the soul of the Democratic Party, Steve, I truly believe the soul has been silent. It has been very, very silent. And sometimes silence is deafening. That's what I believe has happened. Um, the people such as AOC, are, they're aspirational. That's fine. They have some ideas and they want to express that. That is not who we are as a Democratic Party that I know. I can only speak for myself and the people that I know within the Democratic Caucus. But by being silent, it's accepted. You know, we should have denounced immediately when they said defund. We're not defunding the police. We're going to invest more and expect more. That's point blank. We should have spoke really, really strong. And that wasn't spoke, spoken by leadership for whatever reason. They just were kind of silent about that, not knowing how to tiptoe around it, about talking about looting and rioting. I would have brought in the National Guard. I always I had the National Guard at my at my beck and call when I was commander in chief of the West Virginia National Guard. I don't need the federal government to come in or federal officers to come in. We can take care of it. We're not going to tolerate it. But you prevent that by happening because in areas that you know you have hotbeds of dissent or this type of, uh, of uh, anger and hatred build up, you've got to go in there and bring those people to the table first and diffuse that before it gets lit. And that's what wasn't done. But again, the soul of the Democratic Party didn't denounce looting and rioting. So the Republicans picked up and made it believe that the Democrats are acceptable to the looting and rioting. Antifa, I've never even heard of Antifa before. And, and uh, the Black Lives Matter, well, it should. What we saw happen to George Floyd, I think it should have shook everybody to their core to watch a person who is uh, the police with authority basically took the life of a human being in front of the whole world to visit, to watch in the most callous and insincere way. As a matter of fact, this is what I do every day. It was beyond our imagination that something like that could happen, let alone the confirmation of watching it happen in front of our eyes. And so these are the things we speak about. And yes, black lives matter. And yes, all lives matter. But when people have been treated and don't you think you've got to step up and defend and say, listen, we're not going to tolerate that in America. It's not who we are, not how I was raised, Steve. And I think we need to speak up. Have the Democrats yet done, has Senator Schumer, has Nancy, have Nancy Pelosi sat down and really analyzed with those of you who've been complaining about the direction of the party for a while? Have you done an assessment of what, re what, re what went wrong so far? Yeah. Well, let me just tell you. I want to give Senator Schumer all the credit in the world for coming to realization that we have to be heard. Every senator representing every part of this country has to be heard. Those that won and those that didn't, those in difficult areas and what they're seeing and what hasn't been said. And for two days, for two days now, every Democrat senator has been on a Zoom as we are right now, Steve, and was able to speak as long as they wanted to and take, get off their chest what they think is wrong and right. And I can tell you, it has been a deep soul searching and understanding that we have to listen. We have to work together, but it's different. And, and you know, Chuck's trying to hold all of this together. And it's a, it's a real challenge. Anybody's a challenge when you have a tent as big as our tent with all the different people that we have. 
they always say from Bernie Sanders to Joe Manchin or Elizabeth Warren to Joe Manchin. Well, the thing of it is I come from a very, I think a very pragmatic, realistic and conservative area. Uh, you know, West Virginia was never uh, given a lot, but West Virginia basically was always hardworking and never complained a lot. We did the heavy lifting. We never complained. We were happy and, and we would just expect everyone to pull their own weight. We never wanted people to be sluffers or, or slackers. Uh, if they were capable of doing something, they should work and provide uh, value. Uh, and those who couldn't, you should have the empathy and sympathy of basically, and I think the moral responsibility of taking care of those. I think the good Lord put, in, put there for us to see if we would react as human beings. And that's who West Virginians are. Uh, I've said today, I've talked to West Virginians and they said, you know, Joe, we believe that the, West, the Washington Democratic National Party is more concerned about people who don't work or won't work versus people that do work and will work. And that was about it in a nutshell. So we've got to make sure that the people that are working and want to work, that we're the party for them. But also we have the compassion to help those who've hit on hard times, but not handouts to where basically it subsidizes them and doesn't give them incentives to go back to work and making sure that we have the resources to take care of those who absolutely can't because of the challenges they may have physically or mentally. I think we have to define yeah. ourselves better. You know, I know that you're going to be talking to uh, uh, eventual President Biden um, frequently, but but part of the struggle right now between the different factions in the Democratic caucus is what the primary you know, core message of the Democratic Party should be. You know, I, I think that you're focusing on on jobs and the economy as the lead. What mm -hmm. is that tension like? What's the battle that's brewing over what the messaging of the Democratic Party should be? We've got to get back to what James Carville has always said. It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy. And that's exactly what it is. And what's and for some reason, we've got on all of these. And that's where we've got tagged. Washington Democrats must be socialists. That's all we hear them talk about. They want to do this for everybody and that for everybody. I want people that want to perform and work and provide for themselves to have the greatest opportunity and the most capitalistic open society you've ever seen. I'm not going to say that everyone's going to live the same or get the same amount of resources and live and have the same, uh, same type of homes or cars and all that. You'll determine that. But I want everyone to have the opportunity to have the same car I have or the same car you might have or the beautiful home that we might have and things of that sort. They should all have that opportunity. That's what we fight for. That's what capitalism is all about, capitalism, not socialism. Right. Because people are coming to this country right and left because they're, they're, they're fleeing socialism. And so when they got tagged and the Democrats never pushed back and never defined that we're not socialists, we don't believe in socialism. And let me tell you the type of capitalism I believe in. Do you think that the Democratic Party um, runs a risk, uh, essentially, of being uh, uh, taken over by those people who do believe in socializing? Uh, it's different than saying socialism, but socializing a lot of problems, further socializing health care, further socializing education, further socializing uh, you know, finance and, 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 and a number of these issues. And I, and I, and I think it's fair to say that, that the wing of Bernie Sanders and uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, is is comfortable with that description? Do you think that that the Democratic Party is at risk of of that wing of the establishment taking control of of a Biden presidency and Biden leadership? I know Joe Biden. That's not who Joe Biden is. I can assure you that it's not how he was raised. It's not how he's been in public service for all these years. It's not it's not who he is or what he believes, Steve. So I have no fear of Joe Biden. But I have fear that basically they get too loud of a megaphone that basically paints us with a broad brush. It's not who we are. Mm. And the bottom line is they can talk all they want to, but there's not going to be room for them in what I call a democratic party that believes in democratic principles, what we just talked about. If they're right. upset with that, then they'll start their own party. <laughs> That's what I would well, recommend if they're not happy with that. And, but if the Democrats, I mean, we always have a big tent. We want to hear from everybody. I always, I always look at the far left, Steve, as my conscience. And my conscience, right. did I forget something? They're bringing something up maybe I didn't think about. 
in a way that I didn't think about it or didn't see it. So when when I hear of these the New Green Deal and Medicare for all, I've said about Medicare for all, Steve, we can't pay for mm. Medicare for some. Right. Now, the people that have already been paid into it. We have Social Security. Every one of our trust funds are going to go broke if we don't make some changes. Let me ask you the the cheaper, the, the, the quickest change we can make to Social Security. Take the cap off the tax. Take the cap off the tax. If you want the wealthy to pay their fair share, take the tax off the cap. That gives us financial that, stability for many, many, many years. There's little things we can do. It doesn't harm anybody. But we're well, able that. to I can do see the. I can see the Twitter hashtag for that on the on the cap and the tax coming down the road. Let me just ask you one last question, Senator. Um, Donald Trump recently tweeted out, we won't let a rigged election steal our country. This was well after the election had been held, well after the election had been called in Joe Biden's favor. You know President Trump. What do you think is going on and where do you think we're going to end up? That's not surprising, Steve, on President Trump. I'm not surprised at all. He started building this false scenario long before the election because he knew he was in trouble. They've seen it coming. They've been polling it and they knew it. The only way when he said the only way that Joe Biden can win it is if they if fraud and they steal it. Truly, that's the only way that Donald Trump knew that he could win it. So he just reversed that scenario and put Joe Biden's name in. That's the only way they could have, have won uh, because the public overwhelmingly was just saying a change needs to be done. And those people that he lost might have liked some of the things he had done policy wise. They just didn't like, they just couldn't take the, 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 the chatter on a daily basis. They couldn't take the tweets coming out denigrating every human being. You couldn't take, okay, who'd he fire today? What country are we basically uh, uh, discriminating against? What, com what, what kind of country today did we embarrass by saying something uh, that was offensive? It's just awful. And it's not who we are. Americans basically are looked upon as uniting, as the United States, as working with them to improve their lot in life, to prove that democracy does work when people are put ahead of the government and government officials. And it's the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, not of Donald Trump, by Donald Trump, and for Donald Trump. And he had a hard time understanding that. So we'll see where it goes, but there's still a following. I can't understand why, but I guess if you have 70 million followers on your Twitter account, that's a force that uh, they would like to avoid if they possibly can. I still believe there's enough good Republicans to stand up and basically put our country first. I'm waiting for them to come to the front. I think there's an awful lot of people that'll help Joe Biden put a government that's all inclusive together. You'll see Republicans and Democrats working together. You'll see some far left movement of the Democrat party that's mad at Joe Biden for working and bringing in all inclusive, bringing people together. And whether it's the likes of the Colin Powell or people of that right. sort of stature that have been around right. uh, or, the, or some of the Bush uh, people that, that really want a government that's united. Uh, we'll see how that works out. But I'm counting on Joe Biden rising above all of that and uh, bringing us together again. I hope that happens. Well, Senator Joe Manchin, we'll leave it there. I know you work very hard to get Republicans and Democrats to talk with each other and actually pass legislation. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your candid thoughts. Well, I uh, thank you, Steve, for having me and all of you, all your uh, viewers and, and listeners there that that remember we are the United States, not the divided states. Uh, no country can take advantage of this great democracy of ours and this great economy of ours. And we will unite once the dust settles here. We hope it settles sooner than later. And you'll see more and more people coming uh, out of the woodwork and speaking. It's time to move on with our new president elect, Joe Biden. And I'm, uh, I'm anxious to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? The Democratic Party has been elected to lead America for the next four years, sort of. President-elect Joe Biden is going to have a tough time in the Senate. And don't forget, Donald Trump is still going to be out there speaking directly to the 70 million people who voted for him, a real thorn in Biden's side. American politicians are at a fork in the road. Either they're going to figure out how to compromise and play the center, are they going to retreat to party red lines and go absolutely nowhere? It's going to be a bumpy, action-packed four years. Stay tuned. And that's the bottom line.